Hi there, and welcome to the fifth official installment of the Sage Running Podcast. Back with my co-host uh, Sandy Nypaver, Coach hey. Sandy, uh, and we got a lot to talk about. We got some great feedback with with questions. Uh, we got my training plan. We're going to go over. If you guys are watching the the YouTube version of this podcast, again, you could subscribe on iTunes as well as go to our coaching website, SageRunning.com, to stream the podcast as well as stay tuned for newsletters, blog posts, and uh, check out the training plans on there, but um, what do you want to kick us off? I guess I'm drinking, uh, got to plug the sponsors, Ellie's Brown Ale from Avery Brewing Co. A nice, delicious brown ale uh, on this fall day. Um, and I ran out of my ginger tea, so I just put powdered ginger and turmeric in my mug and put hot water over it, and it worked out okay. We get a lot of tea from Flora Health, though. Yes, we that do. That is a sponsor plug. I'm, I'm full ran out of, so... <laughs> Makeshift with turmeric and ginger powder. Tea is excellent in antioxidants. All right. So do we want to get into the questions first or we could talk about... Uh, let's kind of like pick up where we left off last time with your training. My training. Uh, which I realize is a little bit maybe too critical on the last podcast, but it's only because I see how disappointed you are after every race is, so it's definitely out of love. I know, babe. Definitely. <laughs> no, no. The, the, the criticisms, well... I didn't think it was critical, but, uh, you know, being honest and straightforward with yourself, and I think this is a lesson for all of us, uh, why you need someone else looking at your training plan instead of your own self, because uh, you're self-biased, and so yeah. it's always better to have that outside view looking in and, and, you know, being honest, cutting through the BS and saying, hey, you know, you didn't do this. It, it holds you accountable, so I think it's good, uh, and it does, and okay. I, I'm more focused now. Uh after these two disappointments, these two last hundreds, been pretty disappointing. It's been a tough season for me, I'll, I'll admit. But but not terrible. Like, you still did well at Black Canyon 100K. You won that course record. And then third place at Transvolcanion. I actually think you climbed better this year compared to other years. I did beat my um, Strava segment. <laughs> so, yeah, it's not a terrible season. And, like, Houston was still pretty decent. Like... Like what low three or two twenty? Yeah, I think so. It's not, that's not shabby. Yeah, and it, it comes with ebbs and flows in in running, like in life. I mean, you mm -hmm. have bad seasons, you have bad years, and looking back on my running career, I've I've had whole years uh, in college that were really bad, whole years in high yeah. school that but were bad. But let's not jump ahead. Like you still have a couple races where you could do really well this year. Yes, and as we promised uh, for the YouTube viewers, we got the training plan here. Um, <laughs> I wrote it out. I wrote it out. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the first time I've done that in a long time, honestly. And it's really <laughs> sad because when, you know, Sandy and I coach individualized training plans for athletes, we write them out really detailed and, and there's always feedback. Yeah. We're all honest with that. But, uh, yeah, when it comes to my own training, I, I goofed up, you know. I didn't have much guidance and I thought I could wing it and I obviously cannot do that all the time. Yeah. So. so what do you have on your schedule for... Well, I know your goal race is the North Face, but you squeezed some other races. Yeah, in there. so you know, people have been asking, you know, what's what's the next event, and uh, the main focus is definitely going to be uh, the North Face 50 Mile Endurance Challenge in San Francisco in December, and that's always a nice championship event. It's, uh, in my opinion, it's the most competitive 50 miler in the country, hands down. Uh, and part of that's because there's ten thousand dollars to win it. But also, uh, it's at the time of year where there's not a whole lot of other races competing uh, for not the attention. Not a bad time of year to go to California. And it's not a bad time of year to go to California. Although I will say that the one time I, or the two times I've done the race, uh, it's been like monsoon yeah. weekend and they've had to change the course and it's like a mud bath. And, yeah, it's pretty muddy. Yeah, and then the other time I went there, I had the flu and so I didn't start, but that was like a nice crisp winter day and the trails were solid and it's a fair course yeah, i mean it it's is. it's uh ten thousand feet of climbing Which is a lot and 50 miles mm -hmm. um so there's a decent amount of climbing but it's you know it's not at high altitude mm -hmm. it's it could be muddy it could not be muddy uh it's it is fairly runnable it's not super technical trails so yeah, a lot of people like course. that like it's fair for like 
the people who really like runnable stuff but then you also have mountain runners doing well like megan kimmel like one of the best mountain runners in the world she killed it last year so i think you're right like it is a very fair course yeah and it's a good end of the season uh or end of the calendar year at least seasons year round but you know it, a lot of people turn out for that race and you know ten thousand dollars that's a that's a huge payday in, in uh ultra running so uh, that's the focus, and that's in the first week of December. Uh, before that, I'm going to do a tune-up race. So, uh, Well, not a tune-up. I'm going to take it seriously as well. But I was really struggling with this. Originally, I wanted to do uh, a big ultra, another 50-miler or something like that. But I had to be honest with myself. And I said, you know what? You should probably do a shorter race, go back to you know, s- some actual speed training. Because you know, traditionally in my career, starting at shorter distances and then moving up, has always helped me uh, yeah. and getting back into that speed because I, I miss doing the more intense workouts, marathon style workouts. So signed up for the Moab Trail Marathon, which is a USATF national championship, the National Trail Championship Marathon. And last I saw, I think Max King had it on a schedule. I don't know who else is signed up for it, but it's usually a pretty competitive race. It's one we could drive to. Uh, it's a challenging race. It's There's got some little techie parts. There's parts with ladders in it. Uh, it's definitely a challenge. Fun. Yeah, definitely a challenge. True trail race, but you know, 26 miles hard on the trail, I think, would be better prep for uh, North Face uh, in the long term. And it's, let's see, one, two, three. It's four weeks before the North Face 50 miles. So, um, you know, trail marathon doesn't beat you up as much as a road marathon. If it was a road marathon, I'd probably think twice about it. Yeah, you still have to be careful, but not quite as careful right after that race. Yeah. So, yeah, that's that's the race schedule, at least for me. And uh yeah i just got back into to running easy now just for the next week and took a little a week off a little week break rode my bike uh and started doing hip exercises yeah i've been really proud of you for doing that i did and we'll probably do some youtube videos maybe showing the routine and maybe mm. before and after things like that uh yeah just turning in hips and core and it's something i've neglected i'll admit it's a mistake <laughs> as you get older and you spend a lot of time sitting at desks hip flexors get tight i also think Climbing a lot too could uh, make it makes you strong, but at the same time, if you have any imbalances, they really get uh, they really start showing, and so you can't neglect things like that. And uh, it's been my Achilles heel, so to speak. But uh, working on it. Yeah, we'll change that. Yeah. Should we get on with the questions? Yeah. If you think we um, want to add anything else, or no, we'll get on with the questions. <laughs> Got some great feedback. So yeah, thanks for doing that on the Facebook page, Sage Running on Facebook. Yeah, yeah. All these questions are from Facebook pages Sage said. So thanks to everyone who contributed contributed. Um, and so we took the most uh, the comments with the most likes to use, but if you had a, if you commented and we're not gonna talk about it today, post it again um, when when we call for for questions because you never know, like just might be a different audience and they like your question and we'll talk about it in the next podcast. But anyway, um, first question is from Andreas. Uh, he says, any chance you guys could do a video on stretching and recovery techniques um, like a foam roller and give and give us tips on how to listen to your body when it comes to recovery so we minimize risks of, of overtraining injuries? So I, Good question. Well, I guess the stretching and recovery techniques would have to be a separate video. Um, but we could talk about how to listen to our bodies so so we minimize injuries. Yeah, overtraining and mainly skeletal muscular injuries because that's a that's a big issue with mm-hmm. pretty much everyone in the sport. Yeah, and that's like listening to your body is something we tell all our athletes. They probably get really annoyed with us asking how do you feel um, a few times a week, and and I think listening to your body can be tricky. It's, in one way, it's super simple, but then I. I've noticed some people got, have gotten so out of touch with what it's like to feel good that listening to your body can be a challenge sometimes, especially if you're super motivated. Um, so I guess you can start. Yeah. With- um, yeah, you get the self-bias. And so, you know, as runners, we're always, we're, we're pretty tough mm-hmm. and we get caught up in our training because we're very motivated and we want to do well. And sometimes you start running through pain that really shouldn't be there, you know, sharp pains or pain that it makes your form jagged when you're going out even for an easy run. And that's when you have to be honest with yourself, look, your, look at yourself in the mirror or talk to your coach and be like, hey, I need to take a day off. It's it's better to be on the conservative side. You know, I don't have to hit 
that certain number of mileage goal uh, this mm-hmm. week or you know I don't want to rush the process even though I have a upcoming race mm-hmm. or like knowing what being too tired is and I can speak to this a lot because most of my life I did not get enough sleep and so I just extremely used to being tired every single day and until like I had Achilles surgery and started like focusing on rest and sleep I hadn't truly had no idea what it was like to have energy every day um and so I just think um knowing if you're too tired from lack of sleep or if it's training um that's important to do but there are definitely signs um that you can look at to know if you're getting close to overtraining as well. We actually did a whole newsletter on it. If you go to um, sagejourning.com, check out the newsletter, um, The Art of Feeling Based Trading. We went into um, in depth about this this topic. Um, yeah, and I mean, it ebbs and flows with stresses in your life too, like Sandy said, with, with sleep, but also it gets compounded with uh, work stress, family stress, or obligations that suck your time. Um, but also then maybe eating food that you shouldn't eat and, and getting throwing your body into a roller coaster type of schedule uh, could all add up and you know flu season hits and then you, you come down with a cold or something and uh, you could really set yourself back uh, if you're not careful and you don't take all these external stresses into account because it's not just you know black and white oh this is my training this is my stress it's mm-hmm. there's all these other variables coming into play so uh, yeah, it's about being honest with yourself, preventative uh, exercises like what we mentioned with the core and, and stretching and, uh, you know, staying on top of that. Mm-hmm. Not And there are like concrete ways to know if you're getting close to overtraining or um, overuse. Like for one is resting heart, wa- heart rate. This is a, probably one of the most telling ways um, to know if you're not recovered from a workout. So when you get up in the morning, before you even get out of bed, check your resting heart rate. Uh, You'll kind of get a base after a few days or a week. And then you'll kind of see the day after a hard workout or a long run, your resting heart rate is probably going to be a little bit higher. So until it goes back down to that that base, you'll know um, you're not recovered until it goes back down. Yeah, and even like insomnia could sometimes be a sign of overtraining because like, Maybe you don't get enough sleep on average, but if you're really exhausted and then you're tossing and turning at night, yeah, you're it's ironic, asleep, that's true. It's another another sign of overtraining mm. uh, and just extra stress. And then your there's your mood. Like if you suddenly feel like more depressed or you're just not happy, that's definitely a sign of overtraining as well. Yeah, I mean, not every workout's gonna be, uh, you know, butterflies in, in Candyland, but mm-hmm. and and not and a lot of runs are gonna be. You're gonna be tired. You're gonna be struggled you know your your leg muscles are going to be stiff but uh you don't want to have sharp pains you don't want to have that feeling every single day where you're dreading the run the run should be kind of a reward and something that you want to look forward to we tell our athletes like if you're not enjoying your runs most days there's a problem like if you seriously dread going out for a run every day that's not how it should be and that that might not be just lack of motivation, it might be that you're overtraining. Yeah, I mean, it t- definitely takes some motivation to get out the door mm-hmm. a lot of days. And you definitely don't have the runner's high right. most days, maybe. Mm-hmm. But, you know, some every now and then you get that nice feeling where uh, you're in a state of flow. And maybe you get that so-called runner's high and, and you feel great after a tempo run workout or, or something. Mm-hmm. You hit your splits and uh, everything clicks. Whereas, you know, some of the days you're kind of just shuffling through the mileage. And that's okay. I mean, that's... That's to be expected. Running's never distance running is never an easy sport. So, uh, you know, expect your legs to be stiff definitely on mm-hmm. on a lot of days. But uh. and then just we'll go over a few other things. Um, what another one's immune system. If you're getting sick all the time, um, it's another sign of overtraining. Increased cortisol levels. You'd have to get a blood test for that one. Um, then there's could be a change in weight. Either you're starting to gain weight um, or drastically losing weight. And then a big one for women is menstrual cycle. If you notice um, you like missed your period, that's a sign um, you're overtraining or maybe you're not eating enough. Um, and I strongly suggest if, you, if you're a woman, you have a coach. If something changes in your menstrual cycle, that's something you have to tell your coach because something's going on there. So yeah, I think, do you have anything else to add? No, let's move on to the next question here. Okay, the next one is from Jamie. He says, I've run 
five road 10Ks this year, all between 430 and 450. 40. Yeah, 40, 40. But can't get closer to going under 40 minutes. What training would help you get faster in a 10K? Specific speed work, more endurance, or a mixture of both? And then I asked him to clarify this so we got a better idea of his training. And then he said he roughly runs 20 miles a week. And it's typically done in three runs a week, a speed session on Tuesday, a tempo on Thursday, and a long, slower run on the weekend. Speed workouts varies every week. Usually um, the club that he's in decides the workouts and is anything between, from 8 times 400 meters to 10 times 200 meters. He'll repeat attack. Nothing really over 400 meters. Then he also does a 20-minute tempo on Thursdays uh, with a three-mile warm-up. On, on both uh, nights uh, and he just started running this year after playing football um, so yeah this one's exciting because like you can just like look at it and be like we can help you so yeah I mean for a 40 minute 10k is a very good time for someone that that just started mm-hmm. running um, and especially on that relatively I would call it a relatively lower mileage range mm-hmm. I know probably a lot of you aren't much you know super high you know mm-hmm. triple digit mileage weeks but You know, 20 miles a week, three days a week, uh, definitely a lot of ceiling, a lot of room for improvement. But you want to do that gradually, and there's things you want to add to that to improve not only your speed, uh, because usually speed's not the problem so much. People could sprint 100 meters at at four-minute mile Mm -hmm. pace. It's the stamina and bringing out that speed endurance over 10 kilometers. uh, That's the real trick to to really knocking off seconds and minutes off your time. Mm -hmm. So uh, you could go into... So, first thing we'd suggest, well, there's a few right? things. The first thing would probably be to add miles if you have the time. If you don't have the time, then th- you could definitely go quality over quantity. But just adding like maybe one three mile run a week, or slowly increasing your long runs, just adding a few miles and maybe slowly building up to thirty miles a week, and then maybe thirty five. That's gonna help you a lot because your body's gonna be making adaptions. Like you'll get more mitochondria and your blood vessels will start growing um so just like adding easy miles it doesn't have to be hard just easy miles is going to help your body make the adaptions you need to start having more endurance and running faster yeah just the difference between running three times a week to running four or five times a week and like sandy said it's just a matter of adding a couple easy conversational pace days in there of maybe five six seven miles Mm -hmm. uh, on extending the long run a little bit that's just you know raising your mileage up to 30 35 40 miles a week uh really really pays off in terms of aerobic adaptations Mm -hmm. uh, capillary bed mitochondria density and size uh things that are going to make you more efficient uh at the cellular level but Mm -hmm. also in terms of building leg strength and just giving you uh, a way to extend that speed because again the, the sprint speed's probably there and he's doing he's already doing some speed work you know he's doing hill reps he's doing 400 meter repeats he's doing 20 minute tempo runs so it's really just about extending that speed so you could run a sub 40 minute 10k uh, and really cover ground mm-hmm. and I mean it's a good mix of, of workouts uh, you definitely have to have a, a mix but mm-hmm. the stamina is probably the most important part and since he's only a year into to running, you know, as he develops over time, the next couple of years, uh, and slowly builds his mileage up in a, in a logical way, he's going to have more stamina. Mm-hmm. But with that said, uh, I think he could change up his workouts a little bit. I feel like speed workout on Tuesday, tempo Thursday, long run on the weekend, that's a very typical schedule, but I don't think that works for everybody, or at least not all the time. Yeah. And it's tough because he runs for a club, or he does workouts for the club, and so sometimes... It's really fun and, and great and, and social to jump in with, with other runners for workouts, but sometimes uh, their schedule doesn't always dictate exactly probably what you should do, mm-hmm. uh, especially if, if someone's preparing for a race at, at different times uh, or if you're, you, know, you get sucked into running too fast a pace on mm-hmm. your interval reps because you get competitive with, with other people in the group and faster is not always better. So you know, it's like you don't want to blast the 20 minute tempo run as hard as possible when it's supposed to be more at 85% of your maximum mm-hmm. heart rate. So there is that danger. And yeah, like Sandy said, you want to change it up. Uh, the weekly schedule doesn't always coincide exactly with yeah, like what people should do. Yeah, like every other day of like hard, easy, hard. Yeah. Like I think sometimes you could do like maybe like a really hard interval session and then take two or three days easy 
and then maybe you add some faster miles on your long run. Yeah. Or let's say like you change your 20 minute tempo and you do two times 12 times 15 minutes and you have a longer tempo or for your intervals, you could definitely go up to like 800 meter repeats, um, kilometer repeats, smile repeats. And I think that endurance and the strength from those intervals could help a lot. Yeah, definitely what Sandy said there, longer intervals, uh, like kilometer repeats are, are golden. That was our bread and butter workout in college for racing 5K and 10K on the track was, uh, you know, 8 to 10 by 1,000. But for him, in this mileage range, it would be more like 6 by 1,000 meters uh, would be a good. Mm-hmm. And he might even start off at doing 6 to 8 by 800 meters uh, and then build it up. But you always need a changing variable, changing stimulus in your training so that you could adapt and, and your body could super compensate for that next boost in fitness mm-hmm. going back to listening to your body if you start changing it up really pay attention to how you're feeling because maybe if you're adding more miles and adding longer workouts you might not be able to hit another workout with with only one rest day in between you might need two to three recovery days or it might not be good or you might want to just build up your miles first before you start making your workouts longer so definitely a key time in training to listen to your body when you're changing things up yeah and like you know vo2 max your absolute vo2 max doesn't really maybe improve too much after uh gosh when you're pretty young 20 years old Mm -hmm. maybe but you could get closer to your potential pace and velocity at at vo2 max just by increasing your mileage because when you run higher mileage and you have more strength and more efficiency basically you're running economy uh so to speak it automatically kind of increases all your paces, your lactate mm-hmm. threshold, but also uh, your VO2 max pace, uh, or at least a, a fraction of VO2 max, what you could sustain. So, mm-hmm. you know, just adding the easy mileage and being consistent with your mileage over time just allows you to basically bring out more of your speed uh, for mm-hmm. longer periods of time. Yeah, or and another workout you might be able to do is like an up tempo, and our def- definition of up tempo would be. A workout that's slightly more comfortable than a tempo so num tempo it's not going to increase your lactate mm-hmm. threshold because you're not running there um and it's it's a little bit easier but for him let's say you could do 30 to 40 minute up tempo a slightly easier than lactate threshold pace um, and that's going to teach your body basically to be able, or it's going to teach you to run strong towards the end of a workout or a race And that's the thing with up-tempos. Again, it's not increasing your lactate threshold like a tempo, but it will make you stronger. It definitely will make your legs stronger. Yeah, so up-tempo, it's not directly at the lactate threshold intensity, um, but it's if if you don't know what it is, it it might be actually closer to what your projected marathon pace would be. It's generally considered a little bit... Yeah, generally it's considered to be faster than your half marathon. It kind of depends what what time range you're in. Mm -hmm. Um, But it is, yeah, it's a good... It's slower, a notch down from what your lactate threshold tempo run pace would be. So it's a very... And those workouts, up-tempos can be longer. Yeah. I mentioned that. They're supposed to be longer. Yeah, so it's always, you know, a traditional workout would be like a 20-minute tempo run which is we call lactate threshold uh whereas the up tempo might be 30 40 minutes even 50 minutes Mm -hmm. uh, in duration so it's basically running at a steady state uh, if you wanted to quantitatively describe it a steady state type of effort my college coach college uh at cornell robert rojo johnson would say it was effortless effort so you know a notch up from your easy day pace but not quite uh lactate threshold so if you were talking easy conversation flowing at your easy day pace uh and then lactate threshold would be you could say three or four words without huffing and puffing Mm -hmm. up tempo would be maybe you could say a sentence or two sentences without huffing and puffing so it's kind of just in that range yes definitely good for longer races too but i think even for a 10k it's gonna help you stay strong at the end of that 10k yeah builds a lot of strength and stamina basically so good aerobic adaptations. And you'll find that it'll actually probably lower your lactate threshold as well when you do more intense lactate threshold workouts. Yeah. So summary for, so you have more concrete advice. Change up your, your workouts, um, maybe longer tempos, 
Um, add in longer intervals, kilometer repeats, mile repeats, and then maybe even do some of your long runs a little bit faster. You could add some tempo miles into your long run maybe, maybe close to 10K pace or a little bit slower, then add in some up tempos too. And then you don't have to follow the schedule of speed workout, rest day, tempo. You can you can have two recovery, maybe even three recovery days sometimes if you need them, if you do a really hard workout. Yeah, and like Sandy said, with the long runs, it's not always about just hitting a certain mileage number. Sometimes it is, but it uh, sometimes long runs could be turned into a big negative split effort where you run faster as the run progresses, uh, or you even have a, a fart lick or speed play type of mm-hmm. dynamic in the second half of the long run where you're doing surges of three minutes and then running easy for two minutes and repeating that cycle or you're just closing it down with three miles at more of a tempo pace uh 10k Mm -hmm. pace plus 15 seconds per mile uh roughly uh, for this runner um and so the long run becomes a a quality session and a hard session and yeah like you said you probably would need at least two days easy to to recover from that and uh with this scenario he probably might even take a a full day off because he's not running seven days a week but if he's running four or five days a week, that's already a, a big improvement from three days a week. Right. So we'll move on to the next question, but Jamie, if you break 40 minutes in the 10K, let us know. Okay, so Matthew, what to do in between seasons? How long of a rest? Obviously, race schedule will dictate, but if four to six months of down or, or in between season, what's the best way to maintain without overtraining? Um, he said specifically for 50K to 50 mile mountain runs. Okay, so just to clarify, he's, he's taking four to six months off? In I the, think that's in the probably in between races. Okay. So that that's a fairly long break, and it depends, obviously, if maybe if you live in a snowy part of the country or the world and mm-hmm. you do like you ski all winter or it's your trails get covered in snow or mm-hmm. it's just freezing cold out, you might. Uh, have to get creative in the in the off season, so to speak, uh, especially for trail runners, because you know living in the mountains out here, the trails get covered in snow. It gets very cold in the winter, mm-hmm. uh, so it's it is you have to get more creative, definitely. Yeah, I think the best <laughs> advice I probably got on this is from Lorraine Moeller, who's four time Olympian, and then she also um, co founds the Lydiard Foundation and teaches um, coaches. Wait a second, we uh, podcast audio still rolling. I need to get camera difficult technical difficulties. Yeah, it automatically stops recording after a certain time. I gotta check my optimization settings. Okay, we're back rolling with video. Okay. Audio audio was still going though. Sorry. So back to Lorraine Moeller and her advice. She said, after the end of every season, rest until the motivation comes back. And that might be mean totally taking time off from running, or it might mean just doing easy runs. Um, but rest until the motivation comes back. And I like that a lot. I think that's pretty legit legit advice. Yeah. I mean, mentally you want to be in it and you want to be mm-hmm. itching to start running again. Yeah, especially. and it's not just giving your, your body the physical break. It's giving your mind the break too. Yeah. Um, so to, what's the best way to maintain it without overtraining? Um I mean, it, it, it depends, I guess, what you're what you're doing maybe in that off-season. A lot of people will do some sort of cross-training because uh, mm-hmm. they don't want to be – they just want to sit on the couch and eat ice cream for months on end. Maybe you'll do that for a couple of weeks. but uh, Yeah, so maybe <laughs> let's say you have like your last like 50-mile race of the season. Then you take anywhere from like two to four weeks super easy. Maybe you don't run. I definitely know a few people who choose not to run for a month after the season's over. Maybe you just do really easy runs. And then you think about adding in um, maybe some tempo efforts again. Um, and, like, please don't worry about losing your fitness that much in a month. You'll lose a little, but it's nothing you're not going to be able to regain pretty quickly. Yeah, I mean, it's good to have planned breaks, we always say, because mm-hmm. you don't want to end up with a forced break, which would be an injury or overtraining or some sort of health problem. So, mm-hmm. you know, planning this out, saying, oh, this is my off season. I'm going to mm-hmm. relax and eat ice cream for a couple of weeks, and then maybe I'll start doing another activity that gives me aerobic benefits and stimulates blood flow and gets, uh, you know, gets me breathing a little bit, but it's mm-hmm. still relatively non-serious and pretty light in nature. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of people ski cross-country skiing, um, ski mo, ski mountaineering. Uh, a lot of people will ride bikes. Take uh, classes at bikes. the gym. 
you could go to the gym and, and work on uh, lifting weights, actually, but also maybe doing a little cardio. Mm -hmm. uh, some people swim, things like that. Uh, some people just like to hike around. Uh, just staying active and, and maybe doing, you know, you could always do some core work or yoga or things like that uh, to not be, you know, totally um, yeah, you don't not active. But too out of shape. That'd yeah. be good to do a little bit every day. Yeah, especially over, over a series of months because, yeah, you will start losing some fitness. But again, it's better to make sure you're 100% when you come back. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing some sort of activity, uh, you're, you're definitely ahead of the, the curve already and mm -hmm. ready to, to get back into shape fairly quickly. But the important thing, I think, is keeping the intensity relatively low, like below the mm -hmm. lactate threshold. So never having to really, you know, go all out. I mean, some people might race, I guess, um, on skis and, and things like that. But uh, you definitely need to take some time where you're not batting 100% and your fitness is going to you intentionally let your fitness drop, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So you could re reset the cycle and build up again to the aerobic base. Right. So um, let's say you take the first four to six weeks super easy after your last race. And then maybe it's time to start looking to build back up slowly um, again. And then first week might just be increasing your mileage and doing some strides, no workouts. And then next week you increase your mileage a little bit more. And then maybe you include a short 15, 20 minute tempo. And then you can keep on going from there. Um, but we definitely believe in building a strong base first. And the base phase, you're just slowly increasing your mileage. Then you're slowly adding in workouts um, and slowly increasing the length of your key run. So you know, start with a 20-minute tempo. Maybe next week you do two times 15 minutes or maybe you do a four-mile up tempo instead. And you just slowly start increasing until you kind of reach your – peak mileage, um, and where you want to be at for your up tempo and tempo is before you add any, anything harder than that. Yeah. And I, you know, I don't always practice what I preach. I probably should, but, uh, or what, what Sandy preaches as well, but it's most people probably are, are sometimes you're too eager to come back too fast and you want to get in shape really, really fast. And so you rush the process and that's really probably some of the most dangerous times, at least I've seen with people, mm -hmm. Uh, running professional road marathons it's it's after you take a break and then you come back the first couple weeks or the first month of training uh is when people get injured a lot of times because mm -hmm. they're they're trying to increase their mileage too fast or they try to nail their first couple workouts when they really you want to be really conservative mm -hmm. on those first couple I workouts think, you don't want to be going all out yeah and i think that like the base phase of training should really be the most fun because it's it's more about just building a mileage base and, base and not so much about workouts. And maybe you only have one key faster run a week. Um, but then if you feel good on your long run, then like you add in a few faster miles. That's something like the Lydiard athletes did a lot. And Lorraine Muller, again, um, who's an Olympian, did that a lot. Like they hit one key workout during the base days. Maybe it's like a fart lick a tempo pace or under and then like they felt good on their long runs they do a really hilly long run and maybe hit a few miles fast um but it all came pretty naturally because they felt good yeah and you're starting off probably with with medium distance long runs is what i call and i this mm -hmm. applies to me right now because like this is my first week back and i'm not going to do on a full-on long run mm -hmm. uh this weekend it's going to be a, a, a shorter long run and then as i build mileage uh and start sprinkling in more intensity there will be uh, you know, some long runs where I definitely throw down and some, some long workouts above the lactate threshold and things like hill repeats that are definitely a fairly high intensity and you want to make sure your muscles are calloused for that uh, so you don't pull your calf muscle or your Achilles tendon and, mm -hmm. uh, and you're not developing tons of lactate in your muscles and uh, essentially burning yourself out too early. Yeah, yeah, the base phase you should generally feel pretty good. Like eventually you might feel little tired as you start building up mileage more but really you should feel pretty good during that time yeah so yeah just summarize um take a few weeks super easy then start increasing your mileage adding in shorter easier workouts like tempos and up tempos um and doing that for a few months enjoy it have fun and then kind of go from there yeah and you know take as long as time as you need because you need to be mentally fresh and uh, if you enjoy doing other activities in the off season, you know, you definitely do those for mm -hmm. months on end. Um, but 
in generally getting into a consistent training pattern once you come back is, is really the key and just yeah. staying healthy. Or we, I guess I talked a lot about miles, but if it's like if you're running in snowstorms or a couple feet of snow or like the trails in Boulder turn to ice, then it might then you might be in a good good area to go by time instead of miles. Because yeah, I know like if I'm running through a foot of snow, like the run an eight mile run is going to take me twice as long as it normally does. So something to keep in mind. All right, so uh, do we want to do maybe this question here? Okay. Last one. So Marcus this podcast. <laughs> Marcus asks, I'd be curious to hear your take on specific workouts with paces for a sub three marathon attempt. Oh, my favorite. I love uh, people trying to crack three in the marathon because mm-hmm. we've, we've coached uh, quite a few sub threes. And yeah. A lot of yeah. times our people that follow the BQ uh, training plan on sagerunning.com end up going sub three. Um, mm-hmm. even though the fastest BQ time is, I believe, 3.08. Yeah. Um, it changes over athletes, with so age. This wasn't sub three, but one of our athletes just had like an eight and a half minute PR at Berlin, which was awesome. Um, so it's getting down there. Maybe maybe one day I'll get close. Um, but anyway, specific workouts for sub three marathon attempt. Yeah, so a three minute marathon is a 6.52 per mile pace, uh, about, and Gosh, I don't know what that is for kilometer pace. I should probably look that up. <laughs> Do the math. Uh, but yeah, I mean, basically, a marathon is contested slightly slower than what your lactate threshold pace would be, so to speak. And so, uh, you know, a good indicator of that is if you do a build up where you do you race 10Ks and you race half marathons, uh, you pretty much need to have at least the speed to crack 125, and it would be probably a lot better to be closer to 120 in the half marathon first uh, before you even go after that sub three. Now, that being said, if you've run 310 before already for a full, then you're already uh, pretty close, so maybe you know that's a good indicator as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but what it really takes is generally fairly high mileage like our, our bq plan go, mm-hmm. gets up there in mileage because unless you're super talented you have to really put in some work uh to go sub three right um so what i think i have to double check actually but bq plan goes up to about 65 miles per week maybe, maybe, maybe. seven closer to 70 right. uh and you're holding a lot of 50 miles per week at least through most of the plan doing fairly uh long lactate threshold types of workouts now Again, the marathon pace is slightly slower. Uh, what you could hold for 26.2 miles is going to be slightly slower than your lactate threshold. Lactate threshold uh, for this type of time range would be closer to what you'd run for about a 15 to 20K type of race uh, if you're a sub-3 runner. So, uh, you know, 652 mile pace, it needs to be your race pace. Your lactate threshold is going to have to be closer to uh, 640 pace at least, I'd say. Right. Uh, and we have a lot of athletes that run will be doing tempo runs in the 630s mm-hmm. who are going to you know tackle a sub three and run in the 250s so uh, that would be another key workout specific workout as well as getting your long run up mm-hmm. pretty high because you're running pretty high mileage you could yeah. talk about maybe the long run well going back just to specific workouts like you still want to have a phase where you do like the shorter intervals um just doing a whole speed phase, like even doing 800 meter, 800 meter, meter repeats or mile repeats and stuff like that. It's good to still have that speed. Um, but then with longer runs, maybe you want to do some longer runs, probably with some miles right at marathon pace, sometimes going a little bit quicker than marathon pace, sometimes going a little bit slower than marathon pace, depending on how many miles you want to go fast for. But let's say you do a 20-mile run and you run miles – 10 to 16 at slightly below marathon pace um that'd be a pretty good workout that'd be and a you tough can make workout. very yeah you could definitely do variations of that like maybe you do um 18 mile long run with miles 5 through 13 a little bit above marathon pace or or just things like that or you could even do long runs where in the second half you do fart legs and you get well below marathon pace yeah, I mean the long run is always a key workout for any marathon mm-hmm. runner, or ultra runner, and so. But with road marathons, you want to get close to averaging within twenty or thirty seconds of your marathon race pace. If, even if you're doing a twenty or twenty-two mile long run, mm-hmm. uh, so you know the goal race pace would be six fifty-two per mile for three hours flat. Uh, there's going to be a lot of long runs in there that he's, they're probably going to be averaging at least seven twenty 
per mile for the whole for a whole 20 miles mm-hmm. and then doing surges or, or fartleks where you actually go under you know sub seven minute per mile pace mm-hmm. sub 650 per mile pace if you can and to get used to running really fast on tired legs with low glycogen stores Although just as a side note, you shouldn't do every long run hard. You should definitely do those sparingly because those are the workouts that could really put the nail in the coffin. I'm one to talk, yeah. <laughs> um, but I mean, definitely you could do, you know, the other ones, you might do a 23 mile long run at, at closer to eight minute mile pace on the flip side, like mm-hmm, Sandy said. Right. So it's, it is about changing the long run stimulus and then doing a lot of things like two mile repeats and three mile repeats. Yeah, I think those are probably really your key workouts for a sub three marathon is really having some longer lactate threshold sessions. And of course you can't just do like a 10 mile run straight at lactate threshold, but what you could do is do like four times two miles of maybe like a four to six minute recovery jog in between. And that's, that's good. And then just really like hitting your paces for that and ending feelings pretty strong. Um, you definitely don't want your first mile to be way faster than like your last mile in, in any kind of tempo you should be able to negative split all these efforts really um and you don't have to negative split it in the race because it's really hard to negative split a marathon mm-hmm. especially after the 20 mile mark or mm-hmm. uh, after the 35k mark but yeah by you know two by four miles at 6 40 645 pace at least probably closer to 640 mm-hmm. pace with a five minute rest in between would be another type of indicator workout as well mm-hmm. as doing maybe three by 5k uh around that that's pace as hard, well that's a long it'd line. be a tough hard long lactate threshold yeah. session but to get to that level again you have to do a mix of, of speed workouts because mm-hmm. you know sub three hour marathon's not a not a jog in the park mm-hmm. you got to be moving pretty fast so it's a it's a great time and uh, mm-hmm. something you have to have a well-rounded approach towards mm-hmm. with speed work mileage. Yeah, you definitely need to be really smart. Like, especially when you're hitting workouts that long, you need to realize the recovery might even be three easy days. Like, I know, um, shoot, what coach is it? Canova. Like, he has his athletes do some really long and hard workouts, but then they might not do another hard workout for four or five days, which I think a lot of people would have trouble holding themselves back from doing another hard run earlier, but sometimes that's what it takes. Part of the challenge is is the higher mileage. A lot of people are pushing the envelope with, you know, running 50, 60, 70, or even more miles per week. That's hard to do when you work full-time and have a family. Uh, So it is about getting in efficient workouts, high mileage, pushing the envelope with that, and then doing these quality sessions, but really making them count. Uh, so it is it is about periodization and mm-hmm. and uh, combining speed with stamina endurance. Uh, and it, it definitely takes time. It's a huge uh, mm-hmm. accomplishment uh, to crack three hours in the marathon, for sure, for a yeah. lot of people. And this is kind of going off topic, but not really. I forgot to mention this with the, with the 10K question. But if really for any race distance, just say adding strides a few times a week, it's going to help you maintain good running form and and keep your legs used to running fast without a lot of stress. So I think even going for a sub three marathon or going for a sub 40 10 K or whatever your goals are, try to add in strides a few times a week. Yeah, and if, if for those listeners that don't know what strides are, uh, it's just basically they're not wind sprints, so to speak, but it may be after an easy run or to warm up before a hard workout on warm muscles. Of course, uh, you do something like four by 80 to hundred meters at, starting off probably closer to 85% uh, maximum speed, but then slowly working up over a couple of weeks to closer to 100% of maximum speed, uh, mm-hmm. all out speed, trying to run relaxed with really good form, and then taking a full recovery in between each 100 meters. You don't want to develop lactic acid. These aren't hard sprints. They're supposed to be relaxed, uh, fast yeah, they running. they should be fun. Yeah. Really. The fun they they do don't do always really. seem like fun, but they generally yeah. should be. So if you need two minutes even, mm-hmm. a minute and a half between each 100 meter stride uh go ahead and take that and slowly accelerate into it don't try to sprint off the line like you're running the 100 meter dash all out uh because mm-hmm. you might pull a muscle or something if you're yeah. a distance runner at least that, that happens to me so uh, but it's something you want to build in because it's it's hard to run with bad form when you're running really fast and so you're developing more of that sprinting type of leg turnover really fast stride mm-hmm. rate probably over 200 steps per minute as well as landing directly into your body developing a lot of power developing stretching out that hip joint, right, uh, getting exactly. a really good stride length, and then 
making stimulating fast twitch muscle fibers so you, when you do tempo workouts and track intervals and speed workouts or even long runs it just feels a lot slower because you've got mm-hmm. this this sprinting speed from doing strides and it just reinforces good running form basically yeah. so it's a good thing to to always have in, in your program yeah and you can change your strides up a little bit like Sometimes you can do them like on a slight downhill. That's a really good way to get your your leg turnover really high without working that hard. Um, then you could do just your regular strides on flat ground, or you could do slides or strides on a slight uphill um, and make your muscles work a little bit harder. So have fun with your strides. Yeah, and when you start doing them downhill, definitely try to find a like a grass or dirt surface would be ideal. Yeah, and I really do mean a slight downhill because like one percent, yeah, you can grade. go out of control if you pick a steep downhill. Yeah, it's so not going to help you that that much. So yeah, don't injure yeah. yourself. <laughs> is what we're saying. <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, I think that's that's good for the the questions. Uh, is there anything else you want to add for? Or as we wrap up uh, this episode of the podcast, oh, we should mention because we were talking about the ten k is that we are coming out with a 5K, 10K plan event or pretty soon. So um, you should look forward to that. Yeah, stay tuned to that. You could check out, again, the coaching plug, <laughs> our coaching website, sagerunning.com, uh, for more of these reference points, as well as the free pace intensity spectrum chart that you could download. You could su- subscribe to our newsletter. Uh, you could see all the podcast episodes that we've done so far, mm-hmm. as well as uh, you know, more updates on there, old mm-hmm. newsletters that we've posted, uh, and check out the training plans. And yeah, we'll, we will come out with a 5K slash 10K. Uh, it'll be a pretty, it's a pretty intermediate type of, mm-hmm. of plan, but uh, it'll be a new plan uh, to go along with our half marathon, marathon plans, our 50K plans, 100K, 100 mile plans. Yep. And then on our Facebook page, we'll have a call for questions again. So make sure you like our Facebook page. Yeah. And uh, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for subscribing. If you guys are watching on YouTube or hearing this on iTunes or uh, on the coaching website. And uh, definitely stay tuned for more Sage Running Podcasts.